Good morning. Welcome to the April Fireside Chat. As I'm sure most of you know by now, Mike is away on a well-deserved vacation in Montana visiting family. He'll be back in the office on Monday. Looks like as you look outdoors, our May showers decided to appear a little earlier on this final day of April. We've got a lot of information to share with you, as you can see from the agenda lineup. I'm going to uh, soon kick off with some COVID updates for all of you. We are going to welcome back Risa Conklin and another one of her associates, Anna Kelly, to talk to us about the Freeway Pipe Association, a lot of upcoming activities and what they've been up to in the last uh, number of months. Brian Love is gonna share with you a technology update and Alexa evolution. Eli will update you on some campus improvements. Jeff Townley is back with food services updates. Uh, Herb and Doris will provide an update on the Partners in Caring campaign. Carol Ottenberg will share about the recently awarded GEM grants. And Valerie is going to be introducing both new residents and staff as Brenda Thompson, our HR director, is away from the office today. And then also go back with some final announcements and to wrap up the fireside chat. So I wanted to start off with some pictures that really just mark a significant milestone in this COVID pandemic. We were able to welcome back in the last few weeks indoor visitors and finally we're able to see some of those reunions take place. Here we have Chris Swanson in assisted living with some of her family members such such a joy to see these reunions uh, there's while we're grateful we've had the outdoor visitation spaces it's not the same as the indoor visits that can take place in your respective apartments so we're we're grateful to be at this point in the pandemic i did want to share uh just an apology there is some drilling that's been going on outside of my office and right in front of the university garage so i apologize that the noise will probably be coming in and out so i'll be sure to speak clearly so that you can all hear me i also want to remind everyone before we move forward that for those of you who are on zoom or webinar you may check type in your questions in the chat box at any time and we'll be sure to answer those towards the end. And you may also, if you are watching on HHTV or YouTube, you may submit questions throughout the chat to Risa Ransom, Risa R at horizonhouse.org or Lacey at L-A-C-Y-K at horizonhouse.org and both of them will be available to read any questions that come in throughout the chat as we wrap up the session for the Q&A. On COVID, a few updates there. I know that you have all been hearing about the recently updated guidance from CDC that came out earlier this week. I want to just reiterate that what happens commonly is CDC as the overarching umbrella of guidance on this COVID pandemic, they will release updated guidance then what follows is usually a delay for the states to review that updated guidance at the CDC federal level to see what can apply within the states as well as counties within the state. So we are not yet moving forward with any of the CDC guidance updates until we hear more from Governor Inslee's office. We have both on Monday, May 3rd is the next big review of the county transmission rates. At this point in time, we are not meeting a couple of those key metrics to remain in phase three. So we need to be prepared that we may be uh, required to roll back to phase two for King County. And we don't know yet, especially with the updated CDC guidance, if this will influence the current roadmap to recovery phases and if they will be modified, even if we do roll back to phase two. So we will wait to hear what that uh, results in, in terms of what changes to protocol here at Horizon House we'll be able to make. And also the Safe Start Plan, as a reminder, governs launch and care facilities. So here at Horizon House, that would apply to assisted living. The Safe Start Plan is also under review right now as a result of CDC's updated guidance release. And we don't know yet when Governor Inslee will sign off on those updates. And we hope in the next week to have the Safe Start Plan 
out to us another version that will help inform us as to what protocols, if any, we can change. And so both the Virus Task Force and the Health Advisory Group, the HAG members, all together will be reviewing this latest information as it becomes available throughout the next week. So in the meantime, we're going to stay the course with the current protocols in place, and I'll review uh, a few of those in just a moment. So back on employee vaccines, I know that we have been making some good traction in getting more employees to participate in the vaccine. Just a reminder that we are absolutely moving towards the mandatory employee vaccine policy. We've just started union negotiations earlier this week, and so we have to get through union negotiations of which that uh, is on the table. And so we hope to have that um, solidified by the union in agreement uh, within the next few weeks. And so we will keep you updated. In the meantime, I did want to let you know where we are with employee vaccines to date. We have employees who come, who leave. And so currently based on the number of total employees we have as of yesterday, we have 75.4% fully vaccinated employees. Five additional employees have received their first dose and are in schedule for their second dose. I'm thrilled that 12 additional employees have changed their mind and are in the process of getting scheduled for their vaccine. And so we're getting some traction. And when those employees, the five are fully vaccinated and these 12 additional employees, we will be close to 80% fully vaccinated employees. And so we still have that gap uh, to close. And so once we get through union negotiations, we will be on our way to help the rest of our employees with the exception of those who may qualify for a legal exemption from the vaccine. So we'll be sure to keep you updated. In terms of the virus task force, we did discuss and have decided that we will require our third party direct care partner providers to be vaccinated as a condition of providing services to residents here at Horizon House. So those would be individual providers from our hospice partners, home health, outpatient therapy, which is Infinity Rehab here, as well as all of our home care workers. I personally have reached out to all of those partners by phone over the last week and a half and have spoken to representatives from Kaiser, Providence, uh, Evergreen, Can Do, Sea Care with a little help, some of those home care agencies, uh, Carriage Home Health, it's a very common uh, home health partner for us, as well as Infinity Rehab. And I want to share just some of the intelligence I learned in speaking to representatives. No one else has mandatory employee vaccine policies. We are absolutely a lone ranger on that at this time. A few weeks ago, I had reached out to colleagues at the Mirabella at Transforming Age, which of course manages Skyline and Park Shore, as well as Emerald Heights, and none of them have mandatory COVID vaccine policies. Everyone is in this strongly encouraged phase. I even heard from some of the larger organizations, Kaiser being one of them, their policies also do not allow them to ask employees if they have in fact been vaccinated. I asked why that is and was told uh, from their policy perspective, it is an invasion of privacy. So the encouraging news is in the media, there are more uh, institutions that are beginning to adopt mandatory vaccine policies. Uh, there was a major hospital institution in Houston, Texas that has moved in that direction. Washington State University has along with other colleges across the country. So I do think it's going to be just a matter of time before more and more organizations across different sectors adopt mandatory vaccines, especially once it becomes FDA approved and as the vaccine is more and more available and, and accessible. So that is good news. Uh, we are not going to be in the business in terms of our partners to specifically request proof of vaccine. We instead have prepared a written document that is uh, out the door to all of our partner providers with hospice, home care, et cetera. And they will be attesting that they will only send their employees in who are vaccinated. 
to get around their policies of not being able to ask employees if they've been vaccinated. The creative solution they've identified is they will flag all Horizon House resident patient charts and have a notation at the top of those charts indicating that the provider must be vaccinated and if not vaccinated to request a reassignment with their supervisor. So that is where we are at. I wanted to give you the assurance that for all of those direct care partner providers, we are requiring them to be vaccinated. And that will be effective June 1st for them so they have time to get their processes in place. The next uh, COVID update I wanted to share with you is some breakthrough cases that we learned about. I've shared with you over the course of the fireside chats that I participate in a weekly call with state agencies that's available to providers across the state. And that's a call where they have representatives from Department of Health, Department of Social and Health Services, and King County Public Health. Dr. James Lewis is on those calls. Dr. Lewis shared with us uh, last week, a week ago, that they uh, had just learned of a facility in King County. It was not identified as to which facility, skilled nursing facility, however, that was just uh, underway with an outbreak, unfortunately, of COVID cases. Some uh, information he was able to share with us and was a plea from him to, for all of us, even if we are vaccinated, to stay the course with those key behaviors. In this particular facility, there is an outbreak with 26 positive cases. Now, this is again about a week and a half old, so there may have been more cases that have been identified. I don't know. We haven't heard any more. 20 residents of those 26 positive cases are positive, six staff members positive, 11 of those positive individuals were fully vaccinated. Two were partially vaccinated, meaning they have had one of the two doses, and seven of those infected were unvaccinated. It does not appear that any of the fully vaccinated individuals were the source of transmission within the facility. The investigation was still underway at that time, but that was what the early preliminary information was. The fully vaccinated employees who were positive with COVID were experiencing mild symptoms. Thus, the goal of these vaccinations is to prevent deaths and prevent hospitalizations and to keep symptoms mild if infected after being fully vaccinated. At that time, one resident was hospitalized and one of their positive residents was transferred to an adult family home. And unfortunately, that adult family home went into an outbreak, which what that tells me is there was a breach in infection control protocol. So there is an outbreak at that facility. They did not know at the time this was shared with all of us. Uh, what vaccine those fully vaccinated individuals who were infected have had. And they did not know yet at that time what the source of introduction of the virus in the virus in the community was. A question was raised by one of the providers on the call about if this could have been introduced by way of a visitor, because keep in mind, we just recently reopened for indoor visitation. And Dr. Lewis said that they had not uh, confirmed that yet in terms of their investigation. However, he was able to share with us that they did have confirmation that there were some unvaccinated visitors in the facility visiting unvaccinated residents, which is against the protocol that we are under by the state. And that is either the resident or the visitor must be fully vaccinated for the indoor visitation to occur. So that is unfortunate if it is determined that it was a unvaccinated visitor who brought that virus into the community. So uh, the moral of sharing all of that is just to reiterate that we can't let our guard down even when we are fully vaccinated. And so we want to reiterate some of those key behaviors we request that we all continue adhering to, certainly until we learn otherwise as we hear more from the state next week. And that is to be sure you have your mask on, wear them properly, of course, when you're out of your apartments. Uh, in common areas, public spaces, those masks should be on. If you're in meeting spaces in the fireside lounge, we've made it clear that you may have your mask down when you are actively eating or drinking. 
Uh, do you want to share that concerns continue coming in with regards to the fireside lounge and mask being down? Actively eating or drinking means when one is taking an actual sip, once the coffee or tea or water or beverage is placed down, we do ask that the mask go back on. I know it's not as convenient to take the mask up and down, but uh, we're seeing long gaps of individuals in the fireside lounge who are not drinking and the mask are remaining down. So we just ask for everybody to, to help be mindful of that. We also request that you not move chairs and tables as they've been set up in the different spaces. That is to adhere to the social distancing requirement. Again, that may soon change as we hear more from the state in response to the CDC guidance, which does eliminate some masks and social distancing, but we're not quite there yet. So we do ask uh, that you please don't move chairs and tables from how they've been set up. That would be a great, great help. And finally, assisted living visits. Uh, we're excited to share that, yes, those of you uh, in independent living may go visit your friends and former neighbors in assisted living. Uh, because we are under more stringent uh, guidance from the state Department of Health and Department of Social and Health Department of Social and Health Services (DSHS), we do require all visitors in assisted living, including those of you in independent living, to make a reservation. We do have an online reservation system, and that is located both on the Horizon House website as well as HH Connect. There is a link is um, pretty straightforward to navigate. Don't hesitate to ask if there's anything we can do to help support you in that. You simply go to the reservation system for assisted living. There are time slots available. You select, it uh, is very explanatory, and then you get the confirmation of that spot being available immediately. Because again, of the state requirements, all visitors to assisted living, including from independent living, must be screened. So we do need to require that for those of you who would like to visit after you have confirmation of your appointment, before you go, please do go to one of the screening kiosks that would be at reception or university garage. Undergo screening before you uh, go into assisted living for your visit. And just a reminder that um, those visits are to be held strictly in the residence apartment. And we ask that you not uh, roam through the hall hallways or stop by the visit of the residents. That is again, very clear by the state guidelines that we must operate under for assisted living. So I know that some of those residents will be eager to see those of you from independent living. So please uh, help yourself to signing up for an appointment to go visit. And I was asked by a resident, a final note on COVID, that uh, to help the environment and our animals in the environment, a request to, for those of you with disposable masks, before you dispose, to please cut off the plastic on them because they can get caught around the necks of animals, uh, much like we are asked to cut the tops of the plastic rings that hold soda cans together. So I'd like to put that request out there for all of us to help our environment and our animals to make sure to cut through the plastic uh, holders of our disposable face masks. That would be wonderful. So with that, a lot of information. Uh, some of this will be repeated in today's weekly COVID communications because I know this is a lot. And the, the key messaging is to be assured that both the HAG members and Virus Task Force will be on point next week to review all of the updated guidance as we learn more from the state. And we'll be sure to get those communications back out to all of you as we learn more. So thanks so much. I'll be back later to wrap up the fireside chat. And I'm really excited to introduce and bring back Risa Conklin from the Fire uh, Freeway Park Association, and she'll be joined by one of her associates, Anna Kelly. Thanks so much. Risa, take it away. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Lori. That, uh, that was such great information um, and really, I think, reminds us that we are very much still living within this pandemic. And um, one thing that has remained true this whole year is that our 
um, our parks and our public spaces are truly uh, places where we can safely come together with, um, you know, following the proper public health protocols. And, and we've really seen that in Freeway Park this year. We've seen you, Horizon House residents, using the park regularly. We've seen you um, reunited with grandchildren. We've seen you um, taking your walks, getting fresh air and exercise. Uh, we've seen you using your voices, um, holding Black Lives Matter signs, registering people to vote before the election. Um, so many ways that our parks and public spaces are still the best places to, um, to come together. So I'm so excited to be here today to share with you what we've been working on um, and what we're looking forward to uh, this summer and fall. You can go ahead and next slide, please. So um, my name is Risa Conklin. I'm the executive director of the Freeway Park Association. And I'll just give you a quick little um, background in case this is the first time that you're hearing about us. Um, we were established in uh, 1993. We are a community nonprofit. And uh, one of your Horizon House staff, uh, Mike Evans, the security director at the time, started uh, the Freeway Park Association in an effort to make the park safer and more accessible for all. So that is the core mission of the Freeway Park Association. Um, and we are now an official community partner to uh, Seattle Parks and Recreation. Um, we uh, receive some funding and support from Seattle Parks and we really work um, directly with them and closely with them. Um, we are a very small nonprofit. We are um, typically, in a typical year, we're two full-time staff um, and three seasonal park concierges. Um, and we have a really um, fantastic all-volunteer board of directors, including one of your very own, Brian Holtz, who is a core member of our team. Um, and then we have countless community partners, um, you know, including uh, all the institutions around the park, as well as programming partners. Uh, you can go ahead, next slide. And our work really um, comes together in four different uh, ways. We do a lot of advocacy um, uh, um, and stewardship of the park, working with the parks department and building um, a, a team of advocates, a team of community partners. We do a lot of outreach and engagement to the surrounding community, um, offering um, volunteer opportunities, um, just trying to create a story and a narrative around Freeway Park. It's, it's a hidden place, and that's one of the reasons that um, it feels less safe to a lot of people. So a big part of our work is to just, uh, just tell our story to, to both Seattle um, and the region, because it, it truly is a regional um, destination for people. Um, the biggest part of what we do and what we spend most of our funding on is programming and activation. And um, Anna will talk about what we're, um, what we're thinking about for this coming year. And um, lastly, we also do a significant amount of community-based planning along with um, the Seattle Parks Department. Next slide, please. So um, that comes in a lot of different forms. We've done a lot of um, fundraising for small projects throughout the park. So we were responsible for fundraising for the pedestrian scale lighting, um, the widening of the underpass, some historically significant um, projects for Freeway Park. And our most reach, recent project that we're working on is a capital improvement project that's being led by the Parks Department, but funded by the work of the Freeway Park Association through um, advocacy with the Convention Center. We were awarded uh, $10 million for a capital improvement project. Um, and we hired um, Walker Macy Landscape Architects, and they did a master plan approach to see what the park needed to be more safe, more accessible, um, more visible to the surrounding neighborhood, as well as considering that it needs, you know, it's a park that was built in 1976, so it needs a lot of infrastructure upgrades. So their master plan approach came up with $23 million of improvements. Um, and the project budget after all design and management costs is $6 million. So next slide, please. So we've really distilled down to some um, important 
areas of improvements. Um, you'll see the areas in green are kind of the main areas that we're focusing on the two, you know, the two different parts of the park. So the upper lawns, which is the north end closest to Horizon House, and then the Seneca Plaza, which is really kind of like the heart of the park with the Canyon Fountain and where we do most of our large programs. And then we focused um, on three major entrances uh, to make them, again, more accessible, more visible and more safe for people. Um, and there's a lot more on this project. I'm giving you just the bare bones of kind of what we're working on, um, you know, looking at lighting throughout the park, um, signage and wayfinding to help people um, make their way through the park, some more seating that's um, friendly for everyone, um, upgrading all the planting and irrigation to make sure the landscape continues to be healthy and as well as drainage. So all of those systems really need to be um, updated. And then on top of that, we're going to layer some new things. So um, we're going to renovate the bathrooms um, to have them be accessible, um, all gender restrooms. And then we're going to build a new restroom and concierge station in Seneca Plaza um, for the Freeway Park Association to be able to continue to program the park. So we're really excited. If you'd like to learn more about that, please um, get in touch and remember to put your comments and questions into the chat and then Anna and I um, can answer them at the end of the fireside chat. Next slide, please. So the most significant thing that we did last year, you know, we, we um, really distilled the, the association down to just one staff member, myself, um, and I was part-time um, for most of 20, for half of 2020. Um, and then as we kind of learned about what we were able to do in the park again, um, the most significant thing that we did was hire Anna um, to be the park um concierge, she's our program manager, but she spends so much time in the park sort of acting as the ambassador and the concierge. Um, and she's a familiar face. Hopefully you, many of you have met her and engaged with her, um, really working on just continuing to reach out to people and build relationships and share information about, um, about COVID um, protocols, about what is safe to do in public spaces about um, what's available to people in the park right now, um, as well as just continuing to gather um, data about how people are using the park right now so we can um, provide programming and activation that supports how people are using the park right now. So with that, I'd like to introduce, I think that's the next slide, please. Yes, I'd like to introduce Anna Snyder Kelly to um, tell you about what we've been up to. Hello everyone, um, let me make sure my video is working. All right, so I wanted to start with talking about some of the uh, COVID response that we've done this past year. Um, really wanted to get some signage out to make sure people felt welcome and excited to be back in the parks once, once, um, once it was all safe. Um, and so we got the signage out encouraging uh, safe gatherings, new thing, new ways that you could use the park um, in light of COVID. We've also uh, had uh, hand sanitizer, masks, water, all available in the park. Um, and through the cold winter months, we uh, provided cold weather kits uh, to help people who are sleeping outdoors uh, be able to stay warm. That included emergency blankets and some hand warmers. Uh, we're also working uh, to get a hand washing station uh, so that, get a hand washing station in the park so that we're able to have, have that opportunity for people to wash their hands um, whenever they're walking through the park. Next slide, please. All right. In light of um, really the number of people who are under sheltered, who spend time in the park, uh, we've been working with REACH, uh, a, a outreach organization, outreach and social, social services organization to um, meet with people where they are, which is in the park. So they, the last few months, they've come twice a month um, to provide people with meals, 
food, food, water, um, warm clothes, and they also build relationships with people who are who are living outdoors um, and find out specific needs that they have. So, um, for instance, just yesterday, I met with them in the park, and um, one of the men who lives there, or who he doesn't live there, he spends most of the time, most of his days in the park, um, had been looking for new shoes and a bag to help him carry his belongings, um, and they were able to um, find something for him, and um, now he has a nice bright white pair of shoes. So um, next slide, please. Uh, this year so far, we've gotten our annual report out. If you're curious about what our work really looked like in the past year, um, there should be copies of the annual report in the mail room. And there are all, we also have copies uh, in the park during my office hours, um, noon to two on Thursday afternoons. Next slide. This is uh, a big part of what my job has been this year is being being in the park and just making it comfortable. Um, it can be it's we all know how strange the last year has been and figuring out space spacing and what is safe and what isn't. And so I really wanted to provide um, encourage people to use the park as a space to sit and be comfortable. So um, throughout the winter, um, during my office hours. I uh, set up a little fire pit and Adirondack chairs for a place to sit. I'm still setting up the Adirondack chairs as it's um, getting warmer um, on Thursday afternoons. Now they're set up in the sun rather than close to a fire pit. Um, and it's a great spot to sit and read and um, gather with, with friends safely outdoors. Um, also working on keeping the community bulletin board going and the chalkboard. We have weekly, we update the, uh, the uh, crossword, um, a little mini crossword from the New York Times that goes up on the board and um, giving people opportunities to um, give us feedback uh, on the board as well. Next slide. All right, next. So speaking of the community board, um, we've started giving people a chance to interpret different sort of fuzzy soft words, um, words that may not have the same meaning for everyone. So um, asking people what this word means to you. We've asked about peace and got lots of beautiful responses. Um, in this picture you see in the, in the P, um, someone wrote this beautiful essay about um, seeing their their children become independent and um, seeing them grow up to be strong, strong people as something that gave, gave them peace. Now we're asking you about um, what hope means to you. So feel free to stop by in the park. We have some chalk out front and let us know what hope means to you. Next slide. Also, this past month, we've been uh, we've had a, a this program called Love Freeway Park, where I've made these little tiny hands, <laughs> little tiny hands signing "I love you" um, as love notes from from the park, from Freeway Park Association, and I've had such such a great time hiding them um, close to all of the new things that are blooming in the park. Um, so there's still some out there. So if you if on your next walk around the park, if you want to do a little search around, um, look for things that are recently blooming, and then you'll see a little little pop of color and you might find, find one of these hands. Next slide. Recently, we have restarted our weekly gardening parties. Uh, this is Thursday, excuse me, that was my clock going. <laughs> this is uh, Thursday mornings, every Thursday from 10 to noon. And we're working with the Parks, par parks Department to identify little weeding projects, um, helping trimming some things, uh, things that the parks department needs an extra pair of hands with. And it's it's really a great way to get outside. And um, I've so enjoyed getting to know some of you through through this, this project. We'll meet in the underpass um, at 10 a.m. Um, every Thursday morning. So please do join. All right, coming coming soon. We have a couple of uh, new installations coming uh, a week from from Thursday. So not the, not the sixth, as it says here, but on the thirteenth, um, we'll have a new a new program 
starting called Field Guides. And we've worked with a local choreographer and a sound designer to create um, these audio guides that uh, are, it's imagine, imaginative music and spoken word that leads you through the park, encouraging kind of playful and, cur and curious movements. Um, we're really excited about this. Um, there'll be signs set up throughout the park and you'll simply go up to the sign with, with a phone and um, take a picture, scan the, scan the QR code and you'll, your phone will start playing the guides through the park. Um, and it, I'm really excited about it. It's really beautifully done. And um, the music kind of takes, takes you to, to another world. Next slide. Also coming this coming soon, this will start in June, we have um, the Utopia project by Vladimir Kremnovic. Um, he is a, a, a local choreographer who uh, grew up in Eastern Europe and he uh, is, is creating this, um, this movement piece through the park um, that's inspired by the brutalist architecture in the park. So he really felt this affinity with the park because of the architecture that is so similar to what he saw grow growing up. Um, and this is intended to be a long creation process where um, the public members of the public are, are encouraged to come interact with with the people who will be in the park creating this piece. Um, they'll all be wearing red so that you can see. Even those of you who can't, who don't come down and walk through the park, you may be able to look down on the park and see all of the people wearing all red. That's that's the people doing this Utopia project. Um, and then in late August, all of the um, feedback and inspiration that they've gained through the summer from the park um, will turn into a series of performances, um, August 21st and 22nd. Um, and they'll have places around the park and then each group will kind of come together and then come apart, playing with the, the the time that we're going through right now of coming together, the dance of coming together and moving apart um, and exploring new ways of movements through the park. Next slide. Starting in June, we'll have our daily activations again. So um, getting buskers coming a few days a week into the park, the book carts will come back. Um, and then also we're hiring, hiring a few extra staff members so that we'll be able to have a daily concierge pre presence in the park. Next slide. Larger gatherings, assuming things continue in the right direction, we'll be able to have larger gatherings later in the summer, um, planning on starting our Zumba and yoga classes in July. Um, we've got approval from parks to have uh, dancing till dusk in August. So we'll have one evening in August where um, we'll be able to get together in Seneca Plaza and have, have a community dance. Um, then in September, we'll have our annual Fall Fest. And we're planning to bring back our um, Twinkle Twinkle Festival in December as well. Next slide. And I'll send it back to Risa to discuss the Pigot Corridor update. Thank you, Anna. Um, is my video working, by the way? I can't see myself, but that's okay. Hopefully you can see me. Um, so all of you are very familiar with the Pigot Corridor. It's, um, it's your gateway to Freeway Park. Um, it was an addition to the park designed by Angela Denajeva um, that was added on as a way to connect Horizon House, um, your community to the park um, and First Hill to the park in the 1980s. Um, we have seen a significant decline of paid corridor. And I know so many of you have um, been worried about the, the health of the plants and the trees um, on Pigot Corridor. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of update about that and kind of um, a little bit of background. Um, you know, there is a, quite a complicated management agreement um, for Pigot 
corridor. Um, when it was built, there was a, an agreement between the Parks Department and Horizon House um, that the Parks Department manages all of the hardscape and all of the um, infrastructure, like the irrigation and the lights. And um, Horizon House manages and maintains the plants and the earth. So um, that is, we're, we're kind of rediscovering that agreement recently and have been working with um, leadership at Horizon House and leadership at the Parks Department to kind of understand and revisit that agreement to make sure that it's working for everyone because, um, you know, over a year ago, maybe even a year and a half ago, the, the um, irrigation was broken and therefore um, the plants started to die. And the Parks Department, because 2020 happened, they had to reallocate so many resources um, to essential services that all of that deferred maintenance and a really hot, dry summer led to some significant um, die off of the plants on Pigot Corridor. So now we're having to kind of think about, again, how do we get that irrigation fixed? And then what can Horizon House do after the irrigation is fixed to bring some um, health back to the plants, maybe perhaps some new trees and some new plants. Um, so we're, we're talking about that and um, we're already seeing some great improvements. Um, Anna and I now um, talk regularly with the um, the crew lead for Freeway Park, and he is extremely responsive and um, sent a team of people to the park on Thursday to, um, you know, clean up the fountains and, um, uh, you know, with help from us, we were doing a big weeding party on Thursday, um, you know, really spruce up Piggy Corridor as much as we can right now as we kind of await further guidance for the um, irrigation. Next slide, please. Um, oh, here we go. I forgot I added the slide. So something for you to participate in, I mean, as we move forward, Parks Department is starting to kind of come back to things as normal. So we're starting to see more and more maintenance in the park, but they're still really playing catch up um, in all their parks across the city. So a really good um, uh, method of reporting anything that you see um, in the park or around the park in your neighborhood that needs to be fixed is the Find It Fix It app. And you do have to use it on a smartphone. Um, and Anna and I would be happy to help you figure that out. I'm sure um, Horizon House staff would as well, but it's a really great way to um, report issues. I know Brian Holtz uses it regularly. We use it regularly. Um, you can also just simply take a photo of what you see and send it to Anna and I, and we will do the find it, fix it, as well as a direct um, maintenance report to the parks department. And you can also just grab a parks crew member now that they're back in the park regularly. Um, Christian is the lead that we work with regularly, and he's extremely helpful and kind and loves Freeway Park, has been working in there, working at the park since he was a teenager. So he knows it really, really well. Um, and just, you know, stay, vi stay vigilant and stay, you know, communicate with us and because um, it's really together that we um, make Freeway Park healthy and happy and a place for all. Next, please. So um, there are lots of ways to get involved in the park, just the, the, the ways that I just mentioned. Um, and a, another way is to just join the association as a member. You can make a donation and automatically become a member. Um, you can also become a volunteer. Um, we usually have a lot of ways for volunteers to participate in events, but since we're not doing events right now, um, most of our volunteerism um, is in the form of the maintenance parties, but we can use your ideas and your enthusiasm in so many ways. So please just get in touch anytime um, at uh, info at freewayparkassociation.org and um, come visit Anna at office hours on Thursdays. Um, we really look forward to continuing a conversation with you all. You've been a critical component to, um, to who we are as an organization. And I'm just very grateful to have you as our community. So with that, um, again, please ask questions in the chat and we'll get, um, we'll get to those at the end of the fireside chat. I would love to um, introduce Brian Levitt, the IT director for Horizon House. Well, thank you, Risa and Anna. That was really a great presentation and really Freeway Park is such a special place. It was so nice to hear from you on that. Um, 
I have a couple updates I would like to share this morning, um, just about the, the K-4 program that um, the communications team and the technology team have been working on together um, since late December. Um, so in um, uh, December, we uh, had put forward a, um, the Alexa dots. I hope I didn't set off everyone's device in their, in their home. Um, and one of the things uh, early on we had to do was whenever you wanted to use one of the K4 features, you had to say open K4 and then go through her questions. Well, K4 has simplified that. So now you can just say, Alexa, ask K4 what's for dinner or has the mail arrived or any of the questions that you would usually get to. So it's a little bit easier for people to use um, and you don't have to go through the open K4 um, uh, skill anymore. Next slide, please. The next thing um, I wanted to talk about is an update where we can put a K4 on your personal device. So originally they had to be on a managed device that came from the K4 company. Now they've opened it up so you can add it as a skill, what Amazon calls a skill on a device you own yourself. We're not quite ready to get this turned on. We have to do some work in the back end to, to make sure this will work well for everybody but you will no longer need to have a device that we provide. You can put this on your own Alexa powered device. So, and we hope to have that out for you by the end of May. Next slide, please. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about this morning with K4 is what is the app that will be coming soon. So they have an app that's available that you can use on a mobile device or on your computer through a web browser. Um, and through this app, you can get access to um, all the events calendars we have going on. You can actually choose to add an event to a list. So you have a list of the ones that you wanna go to during a week. Um, you'll be able to see the description and all the information about the event happening right there. There's also a resident directory. So you'll be able to, to um, communicate with residents through the app where you can do voice chats or video chats right through the app. So we're really excited to bring this to you. We have just scratched the surface on this. So I hope to have this um, out to people um, by the end of June. Um, we'll be looking for some people to test with. So um, if you're interested in, in being a tester, let us know. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eli who will give a, a campus update. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everyone. So uh, we have a couple of projects that we are beginning in 2021, uh, beginning with uh, the Sky Lounge Reclad project. This project is to uh, address the weatherproofing deficiencies at the exterior walls of the Sky Lounge and East Tower um, elevator structures. Uh, the Sky Lounge will be offline for a couple of months. Tentatively, I'm expecting for the Sky Lounge to be taken offline beginning as early as June, but this is all pending the city's approval of the sidewalk permits, uh, which our contractor actually submitted back in October. Uh, ideally, the permit would have been reviewed and approved within three weeks, but due to you know, COVID, the department, uh, the city's department is all working from home. Contractors can't uh, deploy their normal tactic of camping out in the uh, lobby of that department to make sure that it's approved. So we're waiting anxiously for that approval so that we can begin this project. Um, so uh, again, Sky Lounge offline, as early as June, but we're still waiting for that sidewalk uh, permit approval. Uh, the next project, Anderson Hall, Methune is currently designing uh, new interior finishes, lighting, audiovisual, and acoustics for Anderson Hall. They are working with the event support committee to ensure the space is optimized and that all of our functional needs are satisfied. 
We plan to take Anderson Hall offline and begin the construction phase as soon as the Sky Lounge is back online, hopefully by November. The construction phase will take a couple of months. Once Methune finishes the design, Anderson Construction will be able to develop the construction schedule, which will give us an accurate idea for how long Anderson Hall will be offline. Um, let's see, and then also the corridor refresh of the central and east towers. This project is expected to be well underway this year, uh, pending, you know, COVID risk. Uh, a major scope of this project will be to revise the lighting layout in the hallways, which will eliminate uh, the shadowing that the central tower residents um, have been experiencing. Uh, I have heard concern from residents that this project will cause hallways to be too bright. Um, no, the project will cause the hallways to be very even with light. The, the brightness in the end will be adjustable. Uh, a construction start date has not yet been determined. Uh, the work will be disruptive for residents on those floors and involve many contractors. Uh, you know, to ensure dust is controlled and that the areas under construction are tidy and safe for our residents. So again, it's due to this heavy contractor presence, uh, we don't want to begin this work in our common areas until we feel uh, relatively safe from um, uh, COVID risk. So beyond what I've mentioned today, we also have um, many more smaller projects that are pending or are already underway. So if you see a portion of the campus that is um, uh, that you would like uh, refreshed and you're wondering why it isn't, uh, feel free to you know leave me a voicemail or send me an email, stop me in the hallway and um, there's uh, ideally it would already, you know, be in um, uh, being planned at some point, or perhaps it may already be underway. And if you have any questions, uh, I believe you can ask them in the chat, and I'll be around at the end to help finish. So next, after me is uh, Jeff Townley with the Dining Manager for Food Services Updates. Yeah, uh, good morning everyone. Hope everyone's having a, a good day so far. Um, just wanted to provide you with a, a few things with uh, dining services and what's, what's going on. Uh, start with uh, some of the events we've had over the last few weeks. Uh, we had a really nice Easter brunch back at the beginning of the month. I had some nice decorations. Oliver always putting that great display out front. Um, I love that picture with the resident taking a picture of it. Um, he just always puts up some really great uh, displays out there. And so we'll definitely keep that up. Uh, Earth Day was a big hit as well. That was our biggest night so far in the dining room since we reopened it. We had about 78 people dine with us that night and had every single table uh, taken, which was really great to see. The food was fabulous. We had the sustainable Dover sole, uh, you know, a lot of fresh spring ingredients that Chef Steve used uh, in that dinner that night and everyone really, really enjoyed that. So that was really nice to see. Um, next slide, please. Uh, online reservations, we started that uh, several weeks ago and that has been really successful. Uh, every week we kind of see more and more residents being able to uh, make reservations through the little widget on HH Connect. Uh, it's definitely working very well. Uh, obviously, if there's any questions, concerns, you're having issues with it, please reach out to me or Barry. We can definitely help you get through all of that. Um, um, but yeah, we, we really like how that's going and it's really helping with lunch as well. We're starting to see a little more increase in our reservations at lunchtime. Um, and I'm not sure if everyone was aware that we're open for lunch, but we definitely are. So brunch, lunch, and dinner. So get on there, make a reservation, and let us know if you have any questions about it. We'll go to the next slide. And we got some upcoming events. Uh, you might have seen in the mail room yesterday, we posted a flyer for Cinco de Mayo. Um, we are doing a lunch uh, menu that day. It'll be a walkthrough uh, event in the dining room. So you'll 
come down and get your food and we'll have open seating in the dining room or you could take it back up to your apartment. Uh, we'll also, of course, provide delivery uh, for that day as well. And then after lunch, we're gonna host a little happy hour out on the B1 patio with some margaritas, beer, wine, chips, and guacamole. So hope to see a lot of you down there for that. That should be a, a fun time. And you know, hopefully we have some nice weather for that. We also have Mother's Day coming up. So we will be doing a big brunch that day, uh, starting at 10.30 in the morning until three in the afternoon. Uh, we won't do dinner service that night since we're doing such the big brunch, but we're gonna have a really nice menu for that. So uh, in the next week or so, look for some flyers and information about that as well. And next slide. And then the barbecues, Thursday barbecues are back. We did one a few weeks ago and uh, it was very successful. Had about a hundred people come through for that. Uh, starting next uh, Thursday, we will be trying to make that a regular occurrence every Thursday. Uh, we do know we have a big food service committee meeting on the 20th, I believe. So that day, uh, that week, we'll probably have it on Wednesday, but look for every Thursday, the barbecues. And we also have a backup plan. If the weather isn't very nice, we will do the walkthrough uh, buffet style barbecue in the dining room. Uh, that way we can still kind of have that experience going on. So um, looking forward to have, having those barbecues and enjoy the nice weather we're going to be having. And then next slide, finally, I wanted to welcome Shayla Kilgannon. She's our new nutritional care manager. Uh, she's a registered dietitian nutritionist who is passionate about making nutrition understandable to everyone so that we can all get to the good part eating. She received her degree in nutritional sciences from Cornell University and completed a dietic internship through Wellness Workdays. She enjoys geeking out about food, cooking said food, and exploring nature. Uh, so definitely if you see her, welcome her. She's been here a couple weeks now and we're just delighted to have her on board. Um, very smart girl. You'll be seeing her probably doing these fireside chats moving forward and definitely reach out to her if you have any questions um, about you know your diets and food and all that kind of stuff. She's very knowledgeable about all that and she will you know be there for you. So welcome Shayla and, and say hi to her next time you see her in the hall. And I think that's it for us. So uh, once again, if you do have any questions, you can put it in the chat um, and then we'll try to get to those at the end of uh, the chat here. So uh, I'd like to introduce Doris and Herb for the philanthropy updates. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Jeff. And welcome Shayla to Horizon House. And uh, good morning to everyone. The uh, Partners in Caring campaign has begun very well, thanks to the generous contributions of many residents and some of the businesses that work with Horizon House. And to those of you who haven't yet had an opportunity to make your contribution, we hope you will support Partners in Caring with your gift. We will look forward to that uh, in the coming months. Also, uh, looking ahead with some good news, plans are in the works for the ice cream social, one of the summer highlights here at Horizon House. This year, the ice cream social has been scheduled for uh, the afternoon of July 13th from 2 to 4. We're not quite sure yet as to what the format will be. As you know, the COVID-19 situation determines how our celebrations can take place. So we'll have more information on the ice cream social later in the spring. But I hope you, like I, will be looking forward to it. Meantime, let's hear from my partners and caring co-chair, Herb Ryan. Herb, take it on. Thank you, Doris. Well, as Doris says, we've had a, mark, a remarkable beginning to our um, Partners in Caring Fund Drive. Uh, early responses have been tremendous, both in the amount given and in the number of givers. You are amazing. If we keep it up, we will make our goal, but we still need about $140,000 to make the goal. 
What I would like to see us do is break the record for the percent of residents giving. Now it's at 86%. That is some, in one of the past years, 86% of the residents gave to Partners in Caring. Now, I would like to ask, see if we can get it up to 87 or 88 or even more. We're recovering the full spirit of Horizon House these days. There's much more opportunities to reach out to each other in the dining room, in the hallways, in the mail room, getting out of our apartments more. Uh, if nothing else, what we have discovered through this process we've gone through in the last year is how much we need each other. So let's all give to each other and partners in caring is one way of doing that. Giving to provide what we and others need. So remember, you can address your funds to residents assistance, which helps residents who no fault of their own have run out of money to pay for their uh, stay at, uh, at Horizon House or to the areas of greatest need, which is a good thing. You can give it to areas of greatest need. And if we need it in uh, residence assistance, it would go there. If we need it in GEM grants or uh, other things, it would go there. If it need, uh, we need more for staff scholarships, it would go there. So let's do our part. Break the record for the percent of giver, giving. Remember, no amount that you give is too small. Yeah, and no amount is too big. I mean, you know, if you, if you feel incredibly generous because you made it here at Horizon House and you're loving it here at Horizon House, feel free to give however much you want to give. So remember, partners in caring, giving to help everybody else in Horizon House to have a better experience here every day. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Herb. Thank you, Doris. Uh, I'm following up because funds for the GEMCRATs come from your donations to Partners in Caring. And I'm happy to review with you briefly the four GEM grants which were awarded this spring. I always enjoy the diversity and character of GEM grants reflecting the character and diversity of Horizon House. And I especially like the grants this spring because two were proposed by staff members and two were proposed by resident committees. Briefly, Wellness with Matt Morse is going to uh, propose new gym equipment, replacing a broken uh, incline bench, and also adding some weights and bands, which if you remember a year ago when we were all locked in our rooms, Wellness brought us weights and bands to use. Some of the weights have stayed in apartments because people like the exercise videos, the bands can't be returned, and so we're going to have some new things. Uh, second on the slides is resident, the sewing room committee. The members come in all shapes and sizes and they needed adjustable chairs for the different sewing stations there. Um, we all know how much the sewing committee does for itself, for us residents and for the greater community of disadvantaged people with their sewing projects. So that's really wonderful project and uh, they will have adjustable comfy chairs. Our new care coordinator requested a rolling whiteboard. I had to be told what that was. You can write on it and erase it, write on it, take a picture of it and then erase it to be used for meetings and events. And it will be used just not by Erica who proposed it herself, but by other staff members and resident groups also. Finally, a revitalized ping pong committee, see what I mean about diversity and character, wanted to get a better ping pong table than the one which is on the B1 level next to the pool table. And that ping pong table will remain 
for use by casual players and grandchildren when they can come to visit. But the ping pong committee wanted an A1 ping pong table and uh, the Gem Grant will give them that and it will be placed in the West Wing game room where they have always already scheduled time uh, on a weekday afternoon where they can get together. And uh, I'm beginning to look forward to the seniors Olympics when we may have a Horizon House team someday. Uh, Gem Grants, come around twice a year. I encourage you to start thinking now about the next round of Jim Grant's proposals, which will take place in the fall. Uh, if you have any questions, you can write them now for the end of the meeting, or you can call Ruth Ann Ford. Uh, I would like to now introduce Valerie and Mark Good morning. Thanks, Carol. Good to see you. I am going to be introducing a new resident and so that Brenda can enjoy a well-earned day off, um, introduce new staff as well. So for our new residents, it is my pleasure to welcome Nancy Nichols to Horizon House. Nancy was born in Denver, Colorado, and has also lived in Los Angeles, California. She earned her AA in nursing and BAs in both history and psychology and worked as a registered nurse in the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, or NICU. Nancy enjoys playing intermediate bridge, needlework, and reading history, biographies, and literature. Welcome to Horizon House, Nancy. For new staff, I did not have not had an opportunity to meet them, so I do not take responsibility for my, my pronunciation of these names. Um, Welcome Mesere Woltedick. She's an elder care LPN on call. Also an elder care RN, Zerome Jabernal. Another elder care assistant, Seble Tespi. Elder care assistant, Peter Nujana. Nutrition care manager, Shayla, who you met earlier. New janitor, Lamy Ejeda, and one, or sorry, and Paige Dayton. Welcome, Paige. And then one internal transfer, Chris Senecott um, has transitioned from a janitor in EVS to an elder care assistant. Congratulations. Again, questions can be put in the chat to be answered after. And again, as long as they're not about how to pronounce those names. <laughs> Welcome everyone. It's now my pleasure to turn everything back to Lori for announcements and wrap up. Great, thanks so much, Valerie. I wanna just say that on the transfer that Valerie just shared, Chris, what a delightful, delightful individual. He has worked hard in the EVS. He supported a lot of those EVS efforts up in assisted living during the evening shift. And it was a real joy and treat to hear that he was eager to develop his, himself and advance his career. He went to school and now is an elder care assistant for us. And he's just, he's a gem. And so if you have a chance to congratulate him, please do so. He's such a, a warm and energetic uh, presence for the residents in assisted living. So congratulations to Chris and all of our new team members. I'm going to wrap up with just a few brief announcements. Uh, thank you for your patience. I know we're a little past the 11 o'clock hour, but we had a lot of um, really great updates, inspiring to hear about all of Blu-ray Park's happenings and things returning to the park. So I really hope many of you would take advantage of that a fantastic uh, treat, really a gem in the backyard for us here at Horizon House. In terms of some announcements on the salon, I know that there are ongoing concerns that some of you have continued to express. Uh, Mike will be addressing this further when he returns with Erica Gilbert and Laura Tufts. They are the ones who oversee the salon services. And so I know that they will be uh, connecting when Mike is back to continue addressing some of those concerns and offering some clarification on some misinformation that has been circulating. So please know that we're not, we're not going to end the conversation that will be ongoing with Mike's return. 
Uh, some good news for the next slide, please. Uh, the grocery van, I know that there have been some requests come forward in some recent weeks now that things are getting safer to uh, make sure we bring some, some semblance of grocery trips back and we are underway with the planning for that. And uh, we're getting staffing in place, logistics finalized, the virus task force will certainly take a look at what those protocols should be for the safety of all. And so you can anticipate more information to be coming out soon and grocery trips to begin likely sometime in early June. So stay tuned, it is coming back. In terms of massage therapy, so excited to share that our beloved massage therapists, Laura and Julie are going to be returning. They have arrived to a place of being comfortable now with returning and we're excited to be welcoming them back. They will begin services on following Monday, March 10th. I think that's actually the following, yes, following Monday, May 10th, excuse me, not March, May 10th. And so they have developed through their therapy association in conjunction and collaboration with Horizon House. Um, some excellent, excellent uh, COVID protocols, including both the client and the therapist wearing a mask for the duration of the appointment. You may begin to schedule your appointments today with the concierge and they will have all those appointments available. And they are planning to resume those services in the same space on B1 they were using prior to the closures. So that uh, B1 space across from the little city nook that's where they will be uh, offering those services. Another exciting development uh, that is coming back beginning next Tuesday will be the pool locker rooms. Uh, so those locker rooms, changing rooms will be reopening next Tuesday. They will be managed by the wellness staff members just to ensure we don't exceed the capacity as residents are coming and going. So the wellness team members will provide you access before and after your appointments. And Matt certainly can speak to those of you using the pool and how those logistics will work for your access to the pool changing rooms. So some exciting developments coming. National Nurses Week, uh, we mentioned this and Mike shared this last month, we wanna just restate it again. National Nurses Week is coming up uh, beginning May 6th through the 12th. Uh, Virginia Mason has been in contact with me. They are putting some things in place to really honor and recognize their nurses for all of their hard work. They would love, love to see some of our residents stand out uh, outside. They have been observing many of you who have been out with the Black Lives Matter signage and that's inspiring to them. And so Virginia Mason Management's reached out to me asking if there was any possibility some of you would be willing to create some thank you signs for the Virginia Mason nurses and uh, show your display of appreciation uh, beginning May 6th and, and on Friday as well of next week. And this is another way for us to express our gratitude for all of their work in providing us with that early access to the vaccines for COVID. So that would be wonderful if a few of you would be willing to uh, present with some signs of gratitude. And the next slide, please. Uh, we have coming up next month in May, some small group sessions. Those will be virtual. Hopefully this will be our last virtual and we can come back together in person before long. But in the meantime, you can sign up with Beth Reese and she would be happy to schedule one of those time slots for you to join the conversation. And certainly if you have any agenda items or specific topics you'd like us to speak to, let Beth know and we will plan accordingly. Next slide, please. Certainly if you have future topics, uh, let us know. You certainly can relay any of those requests to Laura Tufts, our Director of Marketing and Communications. And some of these you've seen already, just a reminder of some of our bright spots from the last month, the Easter celebration, and of course, Oliver's just amazing creative talents that really show through in those displays. It's truly a delight for all of us to see that. And once again, featuring the barbecues that have made a return, we'll hope for the, the good weather to be able to have those ongoing through the summer months on Thursdays. And a reminder of our next Fires Dive chat will be coming up on Friday, May 28th at 10 a.m. And finally, we come to the conclusion where we welcome any of your questions or comments. 
Uh, for those of you who are on the webinar version of this chat, you may type in your questions in the chat box and Risa or Lacey will read those and the appropriate team member can step up and answer. You may raise your hand if uh, you are on the webinar by selecting your raised hand. I believe we'll need to see the visual of the person raising the hand for us to identify who that is. And once again, if you are watching from HHTV or on YouTube, you certainly can enter your questions by email to Risa R at horizonhouse.org or Lacey K at horizonhouse.org. So with that, I will turn it over to Risa or Lacey to offer us what questions there may be. Thank you, Lori. So it looks like we have a few comments in our chat box. Uh, one that says that the salon was a concern. Um, one is very delighted about the grocery van. I know several residents are. Uh, and then another one was, will there be input from residents about the salon? That's a great question in terms of the salon. Unless Erica or Laura, who managed the salon, have more input on that. And from our seven attendees, I don't see anyone's hand raised and I have checked my email and have not received anything. Risa, uh, thank you, Risa. Erica or Laura, if you are on the call, is there any, since you're working closely on the salon, any additional input you can offer or would this be uh, brought to the table once Mike returns? Um, I do know that Mike will be following up with a lot of residents on Monday once he's back. Um, and just to, um, I'm, I'm available if you guys have questions, if you want to come to my office or if you want to stop by and ask me questions, I'm available to you. I may not be able to answer all of those questions, but I will answer the ones that I am able to and point you in the right direction to make sure that your concerns are heard and uh, followed up with. Um, we love Lisa. We love Han. We want to take care of them just as much as you guys do. And so we're working all of those things out with each of those individuals as we move forward. So thank you, Erica. Any other questions or comments, Lisa or Lacey? I am not seeing any, Lori. All right. I think on that note, we will plan to bring the fireside chat to a close. I wish you all a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And uh, since we won't gather again until later in the month, I wanna wish all of you mothers and aunts and grandmothers, surrogate mothers, uh, a happy, happy, joyful Mother's Day. Take good care.